Have you ever been out west before? No. I've never. And maybe I will. What's it like? Big. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Alfred Israeli, who is the CEO and founder of Elusive Networks, a cybersecurity company. Welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Alfred, you have a very interesting background. Uh, you have straddled uh, you know, operational experience, but also research experience. And even that, I mean, we're talking very theoretical, highly mathematical topic around quantum mechanics at the... Um, um, Adam Chip Lab, and then of course your you know prominent experience at Checkpoint Software Technology and Cybersecurity. Can you talk about um, both from your experience in terms of how those kind of have shaped and prepare you for the role that you have today, but also generally in that time period, how have you seen the landscape in terms of cybersecurity and just just general security and vulnerability change? Um, and what are some of the kind of you know, blatant or kind of really glaring gaps that we're seeing in the cybersecurity arsenal today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of preparation, I would say, I think uh, from very different aspects, my time in uh, more the academic world and uh, physics, um, as ac academics do, they open your mind and, uh, you know, deep research and kind of trying to, to figure out things that are, that are unknown and uh, pave new paths and such. So I think in general that, tends to open your mind and just uh, it gives you a flexible way of thinking and approaching problems from different angles. Uh, and I'm referring to research in general, not necessarily only what I did. Um, in regards to Checkpoint, uh, clearly we've, uh, a, you know, a prominent player in the security space and we've dealt with many different security problems of different sorts. Uh, during my time there, I spanned uh, different types of products solving for different types of problems. So certainly provided a good uh, ground base for what's going on from a security perspective in the world. Um, all this leading into Elusive, where I partnered with uh, uh, folks from a uh, teammate uh, while establishing a uh, teammate itself. And essentially what we brought to the table was a lot of knowledge in regards to uh, the attacker's perspective. Uh, lots of our people have experience being on the offensive side of things, uh, working at a nation state capacity. Um, and bringing some of that knowledge allowed us to say, well, the world is viewing attacks in a certain way, and many times it's, it's directionally correct, but there are all kinds of gaps where people perceive the attackers to be a bit different than what they are. And in some places, they attribute capabilities that they think they have, but they really don't, and they can't really do. And in other cases, it's exactly the opposite. They think, well, heck, you know, the attacker won't do X or do, won't do Y. But in reality, that does happen, happens quite frequently. And so we tried to incorporate that knowledge and uh, bringing the attacker's perspective to the table to see how we can shift and change the security industry to uh, cover for the things that are actually happening. Yeah, so this is a really interesting topic. And of course, this is going to dovetail into how your organization is addressing cyber attacks by paralyzing attackers, uh, destroying the, their ability to make decisions and, and depriving them of the means to move uh, towards uh, target attacks. Uh, you bring up a really interesting point, which is this notion of asymmetric information where um, whether it's a business or whether it's a government entity, they don't necessarily have perfect information about the other party in terms of attacker, what their, not only the intent, but also their capability as well. Can you talk about how does Elusive Network start to gather some of this in intelligence? 
Yeah. So I think if first and foremost, I'd start with, you know, when you think about these attacks, how do they actually happen, right? And and the attacks that, we, by the way, when referring to attacks, you know, there's many different types and many different sorts. So clearly ourselves as, as other vendors, we don't try to solve everything. What we try to solve for are really the attacks that matter, the attacks that will have a dramatic impact on the business uh, because of you know, intellectual property theft because of uh, ransomware operators that could basically, you know, disrupt the whole uh, organization at a given point in time or uh, or sabotage or things of that nature. And in these types of attacks, what the world has come to realize over these last few years is that infiltrating a company is pretty darn easy. We try to keep the bad stuff out and we should continue to try to keep the bad stuff out, but we should absolutely not assume that that is the case. And on the flip side, we need to assume compromise all of the time. And what is and remains hard for the attacker is moving from an initial entry point to a target asset of the organization. And that lateral movement portion, that figuring out how to move, where to move, how to do it in a stealthy manner that nobody picks up, is quite complicated. It's a learning. It's a learning game for the attacker, and they need to orient themselves and study and do all of this while not leaving any tracks or any signals uh, for the defender to catch. So that becomes quite complicated for the attacker. And given it's a complicated area, that's their vulnerable area, and that's exactly where we can hit them where it hurts, and we can actually find these attackers as they try to propagate inside the environment. That's what Elusive was built to do, really stop that lateral movement phase and not enable an attacker to move from point A to point B. So, so you talked about how you know they are very careful not to leave any breadcrumbs, right? So how do you force them to essentially reveal themselves in kind of this early uh, cycle in the, in the threats as they move, try to move laterally? Yeah, so it, the, the strategy is really composed of two components. Component one is how do you take away the real opportunities attackers have to move? Today, we're leaving behind the network's privileged accounts or privileged credentials, which lie around everywhere, lie around in all kinds of places they shouldn't be. They don't provide a business benefit, but they're there because they're cached, because somebody stored them against company policy, because there was a misconfiguration, whatever the case may be. So first and foremost, how do we deprive the attackers of their ability to get those? Or the, the lack, if those don't exist there, they can't actually go out and get them. So can we get rid of a lot of that data? And we can, and that's what we do through attack surface management. The second piece of the strategy is now that we've got rid of the real data, let's replace that with deceptive data. And let's plan data that looks real, it feels real, it looks like the rest of the information in your environment, it lives in the same context of your environment. So it seems very plausible for an attacker, but it's actually fake. And if the attacker ever touches or pursues such an opportunity, we can detect that with very high fidelity. And you pointed out earlier, early detection, and the, the name of the game is early, because time is really of, of you know, utter importance, and it really is the essence of what defense organizations should do to to stop these types of attacks. All right, so let's explore a couple of those areas. One is, um, I just want to make sure on the first one, are you talking about PKI certificates, uh, private keys, those kind of things, or, or, or something else? So it, it's inclusive of those as well. I'm referring to actually the most common low-hanging fruit is actually privileged credentials. So think about a domain administrator inside the environment that has superior capabilities and can basically access any machine and the domain mm -hmm. itself and so on and so forth. We see time after again, where you have domain administrator credentials stored or cached in memory of all kinds of various endpoints and servers inside the environment. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that domain admin logged into that machine, did some work and then closed his remote desktop session without explicitly logging off. Mm. And Windows caches those credentials. So we see that everywhere. You think about a server that you have many administrators logging into to perform work periodically, and those servers become an abundance of opportunities for, for attackers. They have now dozens of privileged accounts lying around in memory. And if an attacker lands on that server, he can now gain those strong credentials and do whatever he wants inside the organization, basically. So that's a prominent example. There's many others, but that's probably the most common one. 
So, so in that regard, what's being done at the memory level so that even if, let's say, the users didn't exactly follow, you know, policy per se, but properly logging out, uh, are, are there ways to be able to actually, you know, kind of clear that from the memory? Absolutely. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and so so that it becomes more systematic, even though there's the failure failure point. Oftentimes, of course, are the humans themselves, but you know, systems can actually help address some of those things. Yeah, exactly. To I think you you hit the the nail on its head. We can't rely on humans because we'll all make mistakes, and not everybody is uh, very security savvy and makes sense, and they never will be. Right? Uh, people do their own job, and they they have their own profession. We can't expect them to always be thinking security all the time. So we'll always have these types of issues. What Attack Surface Manager was, de was designed to do is one, give organizations visibility into it so they can actually see where these things are because they don't today. Today it's just there, but they don't know about it. So first and foremost, gain visibility into it. But secondly, knowing that security organizations have so much on their plate now, we didn't wanna deliver yet another list of things they need to do. And so we've built automation, uh, automatic remediation capabilities into the product. So it'll go out and clean these things as they pop up. And so it constantly, you can think about it as we're running behind the users. The users are in, invariably making mistakes and we're running behind that and cleaning those mistakes so that the attackers don't have those opportunities. Yeah. The, the second part you talked about is this notion of almost like a mousetrap. So <clears throat> you intentionally leave what it appears to be precious, you know, let's, let's call it acorn for squirrels as these hackers are sniffing around for things. Um, can you talk about how do you determine where to place it and what is perceived as valuable so that they would actually take the bite? Yeah. So that's very much based on kind of where we started in our genesis, uh, having a lot of uh, knowledge on how attackers operate, where they dig around, what's interesting to them, and so on, is kind of the foundation of how we were built and why we, we create the types of deceptions we create. And moreover, how we craft the deceptions themselves so they won't be identifiable mm -hmm. by an attacker. And so we have somewhere around 60 to 70 different deception techniques in various places that attackers will look, um, from Windows memory to credentials manager to various configuration files of your, your favorite SSH clients and FTP clients and database clients and many other places. And the essence there is plant these deceptions that will blend into the environment, they'll look real, they'll feel real. And if I, as an attacker, land on that machine now, typically I won't even know I'm confronted with deception. But even if I do know I'm confronted with deception, given everything looks the same, I have to gamble. And if I have to gamble, how many times am I going to guess correctly when I have a 20% chance to, to guess correctly every time? And so very quickly in my decision-making process, I make a mistake and then I'm identified. And that brings us back to that time factor, and this is why it's such early detection, why in my first lateral moves, I've already, uh, I can, the, the organization has uncovered that type of activity. Now, um, for those that are listening, including potentially uh, state actors and whatnot, uh, organized crime, um, when they know that such strategies exist to intentionally decept the attackers, um, how, what's their rationale and thinking process as they work through the prob probabilistic outcomes and how do they potentially not fall through your traps and, and where do you ultimately essentially hide the true valuable information? So a great question. In general, I would say, um, that the whole essence here will, you know, will threat actors try to circumvent solutions? Absolutely. But then I'll, I'll talk about two important points. Number one is that you know, security by obscurity is a, is a foul word, right? And so we took that very much in, in perspective and, uh, and it's, it's a, a core value of what we do that it, it, it is not dependent on the attacker knowing or not knowing deception is there. This has now been vetted by over 130 red team exercises where we were involved in, where red teams were brought in, these simulated attackers, and the rest, you know, what they tried to achieve was to circumvent the solution. Mm -hmm. And we, this is probably our biggest source of pride. We are undefeated. There hasn't been a single case where the red teams have been able to get to the target they were after without tripping elusive on the way. So 
it works. It works even for the knowledgeable attacker. That's, Secondly, that's, uh, that's very impressive, by the way. Thank you. Secondly, I'll say, I know we chatted about this earlier and, and you brought up this uh, uh, point of view, which I couldn't agree with more. At the end of the day, it's an ROI game. And especially when you think about cyber criminals, they're financially driven. They want to spend their time on what will give them the best return. And if I make attacking environment now tenfold or twentyfold or fiftyfold more expensive and more time uh, taking more time than the next environment, then why attack this environment? Go to the place that's easier to attack. Um, this is, e you know, a direct and clear conclusion for cyber criminals. But moreover, this is relevant for nation state attackers as well, because not always do people realize this. But you think about nation state operators, it's not like they don't have efficiency built into their systems and their processes. They also have a bank of targets and they're prioritized and you spend time on, on where you can get the biggest bang for your buck. And if your target number 10 has just become really, really, really expensive, maybe it makes sense to swap that out with target number 11, which is still a lot easier to do. So in all of these cases, it's really about how do we make it really, really hard for the attacker to, to achieve their objective? Yeah, I, I think that's a, it's a, such an important point that especially on the, on the corporate side, the enterprise side of those that are purchasing cybersecurity solutions really need to think about it. Sometimes I think they think too simplistically in terms of just hardening uh, some of these uh, you know, surface areas, but it's really about thinking about the fundamental economics, right? And if the economics weighs in such a way, um, you know, you're basically creating a disincentive for them. And I mentioned before the interview, uh, Professor Sal Stoffel, where he's actually working on uh, phishing techniques where he intentionally allows um, uh, these attackers to, you know, what they think is, you know, the, an actual site, but in fact, it's an actual, actually it's deception site. And it actually floods their data with bad data so that their data becomes less valuable to sell in the black market, as an example. Yep. Very interesting. Um, can you talk about some um, very specific use cases? I think you start to kind of get into it, but maybe either sector or use case of how this um, solution is really helping and, and what's, you know, essentially what's the ROI back to, to the, the enterprise customers been so far? Sure. Um, so the primary use cases that, uh, that were uh, purchased for are really uh, three. First is the tax surface management. Those organizations that say, well, over years and years and decades, we've basically fortified our environments from the outside and we built these big walls and we put a lot of investment on how to keep bad stuff out. But we've left, we're very soft on the inside. And how do we start to make our inside become harder and uh, uh, more robust and, and ready for uh, threat actors that are operating within. So attack surface management, internal attack surface management is one use case that we help our clients a lot with. The second is deterministic threat detection. And so with threat detection, everybody realizes that dwell time is way too long. It takes a lot of time until we realize we even have an attacker inside our environment. And moreover, with probabilistic detection, many times that's not even seen. And by the way, a perfect example, we're in the midst of uh, uh, the solar wind supply chain attack, which honestly shouldn't really be called solar winds anymore because that's maybe the most prominent intrusion vector, but there's been multiple. Mm -hmm. But how long did this attack happen without anybody noticing it? Months and months in, right? And um, this just goes to say that we have a significant gap in our detection capabilities in the world. So a primary use case we're brought in for is better threat detection, uh, deterministic threat detection. That's the second. And the third is around SOC efficiency, security operations center efficiency. And the essence there is that we, we're all aware of the skills shortage. It's hard to get good people and we're flooded with alerts. There is no way that whatever amount of people we bring in, and we can't, even if we wanted to, um, we can deal with the sheer amount of false positives that many solutions create out there. And so they bring us in because of the telemetry we're able to grab. And by doing so, we're able to make other tools a lot more efficient. We're able to 
allows stock analysts to make quick decisions on things that they see by other systems, if it's a true positive or a false positive, should they invest the time to investigate or should they throw the ticket out altogether because it's not interesting? So I want to combine a couple of the topics that we've been uh, discussing. One is uh, this reference to solar wind, and then the other aspect is this notion of, you know, you, you know the attackers have a priority of who they want to go after based on expected, you know, outcome or sum of, you know, results, right? Typically, that's economical. Um, so you mentioned that, uh, you know, if target number 10 becomes too costly to attack, then maybe they get lower interest priority to maybe, you know, 12 or whatnot. But that kind of paints a uh, zero sum or win lose game scenario, right? Um, so, in the case of uh, the recent attacks to the, the government agencies uh, through some of the contractors and subcontractors, how do we start to create this level of resiliency inside? You know, the, you talked about the softness, right? When in fact that landscape is very broad. I mean, you got the prime or the big defense contractors, but then they're deploying or employing uh, through the various subcontracts thousands potentially of these smaller contractors that don't really have this capability. So uh, even though you try to make it fair and create a, a plain field, uh, it ends up being quite fragmented. Yeah, t totally. One of the, the biggest challenges out there. There's so many third parties we work with, and that, that introduces a huge risk to uh, to all companies, basically. And some of them, to your point, some of them are technology risks, like in the, in the solar ones Orion server, but in some cases, it's contractors and such which are connected, as we saw, for example, in the Target attack way back in December 2013, right, where Target was... The original intrusion had happened through an HVAC contractor that, that was working with Target. So absolutely, this introduces a lot of risk. And that's why our notion and our belief is assume compromise. You have to assume your compromise all of the time. And what do you do if you are compromised? And our thinking around that is if we can create a hostile environment for an attacker, environment that he can't operate in in the way he's accustomed to and in a way that's cost efficient for him then we win that's the essence of it the essence is even if somebody got in through your software through your third-party vendor through phishing through anything else through the endless amount of of vectors inside he lands the attacker lands inside an environment that is hostile and is working very much against him mm. Very good. Well, I wish we had more time to go into some of the some of the, the the techniques within that. But I want to ask you, in the context of COVID, what does you know what is kind of the, the the new level of risk that we're facing, given the fact that not only is everybody working remotely, but also from a state actor as well as organized crime rings, that it's a great time to exploit, right? Because everybody's online and they're leaving footprints and things being left in the memory, as as an example. Absolutely. Yeah, to your point, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for attackers. Um, the attack surface has increased significantly um, from a variety of reasons. People online, to your point, people using, you know, their families using their work laptops and things of that nature. So there's multiple additional ways in. And pl uh, plus uh, what we've seen over the last few months, um, uh, some chaotic attributes to the environment, right? And people working later, working earlier, anomalies suddenly pop up all of the time, so it's harder to identify things. So a phenomenal opportunity for attackers, and certainly they're using it. Um, some of the attacks that have played out uh, have been directly correlated to, to the fact that it's possible now, but moreover, I think that attackers, nation state operators, and others have been laying a lot of seeds, uh, or planting a lot of seeds over these last few months, which will they're going to capitalize on in the next few months. Interesting. So, Very interesting. Certainly a great opportunity for them. Well, we are almost out of time. My last question for you is lessons learned in terms of you know prior projects or uh, product failures and any type of insights that you can share with the listeners. Yeah, sure. Um, I think probably the biggest lesson learned for me is don't underestimate the complexities of working with the biggest organizations out there. So our kind of sweet spot or, you know, many of our customers are, are huge Fortune 100 companies and 
they work globally and you know with all of the challenges between a, a big global environment and the various departments and the and and the you know everything associated with it um some of the things that you you would think if you work with a a, a fortune 800 company it would be very similar with a fortune 10 company um but uh, that is not always the case and some of these huge companies out there they introduce new requirements, new challenges, new scale related issues that you really have to think through and you just have to plan for and, and knowing that you're going to have to make your product more robust and work in these very, very large environments. So that's an area that I think we, we early on, we had overlooked. We were uh, happily, I can say we were quick to adapt and uh, make the modifications needed and the changes needed and set aside the personnel needed to actually uh, build out for these scales, but but certainly an important lesson learned. That's a very practical insight. And with that, I've been joined by Offer Israeli, CEO of Elusive Networks. Thank you for joining today. Thank you so much. All right. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.